So, like, this one was supposed to be, like, Dream V Nightmare. Mm-hmm. Um, and I actually got some questions slash topics from uh, the 2RP website and also from another Discord server. Uh, first one was they wanted to know uh, what was known about the other tree. They said it'd be cool to hear speculation on what happened to it when Mordramoth woke up. Yes. I'm just I'll really bitter that. about that because, like, <sighs> we were supposed to get that in Heart of Thorns and we didn't. Yeah. And I'm so mad about it. So mad about so many things regarding Heart of Thorns. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah. Yeah. Like, there's so much opportunity for so much lore to have been put in for Silvari, and like, it's just, I mean, you look at Path of Fire, you get all this, like, human lore and specialization lore and freaking lore about everything. Like, every NPC tells you everything you've ever wanted to know. And then you go to Heart of Thorns, it's like, shrug. We don't yeah. know. We don't know what's going on. You just go kill a dragon. It's okay. I mean, there was, there was a little bit that was added in, not exactly afterwards per se. Like with the uh, what are they called? Not the the living season stories, but the the, sh- the short stories that they put out in the living season episodes. Mm-hmm. Oh, the current events. Yeah, the current event stories. Mm-hmm. There was a little bit to deal with the pale tree. And was there? The aftermath of, yeah, there was the um, there was the statue to Traherne, and there was the um, the statue reforging, yeah, and <laughs> reforging Khaled Volg, mm-hmm. which you know, is not much, but there was at least a little bit, and it was yeah. definitely during a developer AMA during one of the Living Story updates. Someone asked about uh, Nightmare Court now that uh, Grand Duchess Fowlin has been killed off mm-hmm. and what happened in Nightmare Court during that time period how did Grand Duchess Fowlin come to be in the same place as Aerith Galkin? like what was she even doing mm-hmm. in that that far uh, west and the developer said that they had a story and that they were going to be working on it and then we've seen nothing from that maybe someday yes that's what I'm saying <laughs> I mean, it'd be, be cool if it was uh, like included maybe as like an additional like uh, Twilight Arbor dungeon path because all the other dungeons have, like, what, three or four different paths you can take, and Twilight Arbor only has two? Yeah. Uh, or even a fractal. Yeah. I'd be fine with a fractal. Or, yes. Or a raid. You want to get role players into raiding? Do that. <laughs> yeah. I mean, there was that whole thing where the, um... Uh, man, uh... Because I'm not remembering this now, because that, that was the update before the Nightmare Tower fractal mm-hmm. was released. And so it was like, oh yeah, we're working more on the Nightmare Court story, and the next update was Nightmare Fractal release. And I was like, oh my god, I've got to go play this right now. And then it wasn't and the then, same thing. And then it, it wasn't the same thing, and I was, I was a little bit, a little more than a little bit upset. Yeah, honestly. I when I heard Nightmare Fractal, I was like, oh my god. Uh, and then, and then no, I mean it's still good because I, uh, I feel like that was that's like the most of season one that I'm ever gonna get. So, I I still like that fractal. It's it took me a while to actually mm-hmm. figure it out because <laughs> there's but so yeah. much going on. But there's there is a lot going on. But I mean, it is actually like one of the fractals I enjoy them more. I feel like the newer ones they're releasing. This is unrelated to RP, but the newer fractals <laughs> that they're coming out with just have more mechanics and are just more enjoyable because they're not just like you turn into a char and you run around and shoot things right which don't get me wrong that was fun the first time I played it mm-hmm. it's like oh we're back in Ascalon that's pretty cool and then you realize you have to do it a hundred times mm-hmm. that was the first fractal I ever actually set foot into because one day yeah, I was just randomly just like I'm bored what is there to do in this game other than RP? <laughs> so I was exploring like PvP and like World v. World, God, World v. World. <laughs> and then 
I was standing outside the fractal lobby and LFG just always like terrified me because I'm just like, these people are going to know that I don't actually know how to play this game. <laughs> yep. Uh, so I just randomly joined on like a level one. I'm like, it's level one. Like people are supposed to be shit at level one, right? Mm -hmm. So I, I went in and then and suddenly I'm a char. I'm like, what the hell is yeah. going on? Yeah, what the what the hell's going on here, yeah. guys? In my RP it, gear. Please? In your RP <laughs> gear, no less. Oh, man. Yeah. With my... I was, like, the stereotypical barebow ranger because I didn't know how anything worked. Lily was the only character I actually played, and that was, like, before any expansion, so it was just vanilla ranger. And uh, I had a longbow... And I had Pooh, uh, with, uh, her, the bear, the brown bear. Right. Um, and I think the other pet that I had was uh, was a raven, because that was her uh, her other in-character pet. <laughs> right. So, I don't even remember what I had for uh, her. I don't even think I had a proper build. I think I just had whatever sounded good at the time. Like, oh, man. Char for char her character. I'm oh. just like, yeah, I think she'd go with, like, you know, this trait line. And the trait trees and everything were so so much different back then. So it was so much more. It's, like, so much easier to understand now. But we're talking, like, four years ago. <laughs> man. <laughs> just, like, man. the people were nice, though. They were... Uh, they, they helped me out. They told me what to do. And, uh, I at least knew how to chat in the different chat channels. <laughs> That's good. So you weren't just doing, you know, roleplay chat yeah. <laughs> the whole way through. Yeah. And, uh, I think the next one, I, that one went so well that I tried cliffside next. And I remember picking up oh. the hammer and just like, no. what am I supposed to do with this? <laughs> this yeah, cliffside is definitely not the one to do second. No, it was not. I kept getting knocked off. It was horrible, and then I never went into fractals for, like, a long time after that. <laughs> That's hilarious. It was so bad. That's not related to anything we're supposed to be talking about. <laughs> nope. <laughs> I googled Malik Guild Wars 2 and brought him up on the wiki. And, I mean, you know, it, it says um, basically everything you know about him from the, uh, from the, the story that you do. Um, mm -hmm. And then, like, in the notes, it says that um, during the Nightmare Chamber step of Season 1 living story, Scarlet apparently talks about him to characters who participated in uh, his story. Huh. That's um, something new that I didn't know. Yeah, and I actually clicked on the link that it gave. It says, like, oh, during the Nightmare Chamber step, and I'll link the the wiki in the description but so I clicked on that and that took me to like another thing I had to click on uh, and I ended up finding like all the dialogue from that whole thing and literally just one line so Scarlet doesn't even like engage in conversation about him she just says oh I know your secret about Malik you know oh how you thought you were like, or something. like like you thought you'd keep that a secret like ha 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 in Scar in you know classic scarlet tones or whatever but right right then that's all she says and then she moves on <laughs> that's oh my god ain't it <laughs> why are you uh, like this and then the next note says malik's tree remains unaccounted for though it was part of the initial plans for heart of thorns yeah <sighs> and i'm just like Mm -hmm. so upset <laughs> that, yeah. cause like I've even heard like I don't have any like sources to cite but one of my friends had told me that in Dragon Stand there was actually a fourth lane originally and an entire like story chapter of Heart of Thorns that just dealt with the Nightmare Court and that's where you meet uh, Duchess Chrysanthia, who you see at the end of Dragon Stand um, on yeah. one of the islands. She is gorgeous. <laughs> yeah. But, and then, like, so that whole, like, fourth lane was, like, going through and, like, doing stuff with the Nightmare Court. 
and because like the NPC still says like oh it's nice to see you again I'm just like wait what like this is the first time I've met you <laughs> and then that yeah. just all got cut and I don't understand why it would get cut unless they were just like oh my god timelines we have to ship this by this time and anything not done scrap it like I mean if you if you look at some of the original like tr- not teasers but like trailers for Heart of Thorns mm-hmm. it shows um Auric Basin it shows the whatever I've even forgotten the name of the freaking city that's Tarir? how little I go into Tarir yeah it shows Tarir as like an actual city with like houses and things mm-hmm. that you know isn't just a hey look there's dragon people here yeah <laughs> they're dragon people they like the dragon a lot <laughs> You know? Yeah. Yeah, it's like yeah. stuff you, you we saw in, like, the teaser trailers. Like, we never actually saw in-game. And that was a little disappointing. Well, not a little. Dis- it was really disappointing. Yeah. It was very disappointing. And I think everyone has their own personal headcanon about what happened to Malik and, uh, oh, and his tree. Since we never saw it in Heart of Thorns, ev- a lot of people are just like, oh, it must have been destroyed or... Oh, oh, since Malik didn't have the protection of the dream or nightmare or anything like that, he's probably he probably became a Mordrum, and we probably killed him or he died, and we just never like right noticed. I because... personally, I personally like to think that the um the blighting pod pod tree in Heart of Thorns is was Malik's original tree. Is that the one it... in uh, Verdant Brink? Yeah. Yeah, that's my own personal thing too. Like, I'm just whenever I see that, I'm like, that had to have been Malik's tree. Because it's it's a it's a large tree, so it's it's, it's definitely something that like, and mm-hmm. of course there's the there's the people that say it can't be Malik's tree because it's it's not actually a, a Mordrum tree. It's a more of a captured dead people tree. The Mordrum aren't actually made there. They're just the dead people are taken there to be studied, essentially, mm-hmm. not really turned into Mordrum. Like in Auric Basin, um, when you're doing the meta, there's, I think it's the Southern at Southwatch, um, the events that go through there um, take you through, like, some areas that you can only get to during that chain of events, um, and, like, there's pods where, like, commands oh, yeah. are made or whatever, like, so, yeah. yeah, so, like, there's those different kinds of things, like... It's also terrifying when you uh, log out there and log back in when the meta's not going on and then everything wants to kill you and you can't get out. Yeah, I actually remember doing that a fair <laughs> amount of times. <laughs> well, because I was, I was always trying to map complete by myself because mm-hmm. this was before I had any friends. Mm-hmm. And so um, I'd use the meta to get into place and then not follow the meta out to yeah. try and map complete. <laughs> And it was just, it was hell on earth, let me tell you. But yeah, so I, I personally like to think that that's kind of, um, mm-hmm. the, 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 the blighting pod tree in uh, Verdant Brink is Malik's chest, because it's, it's definitely got some importance that's never really explained at all. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and it is, like, ridiculously big, and, I mean, so is the pale tree, and then it's just, I think that... I'd have to look at the map. Let me actually see if I can bring up a map on a... I'm sure I can. On the frickin'... On the Google. The thought that he kind of, like, washed downstream was the was what one of the healer mender people, whatever they were, said. Yeah. Or um, Malik said that he, he woke up downstream or in this middle of the stream and yeah, was like, hey... Yeah, I think we actually, when, you, um, when, we, when you're doing the story, because I've only done it a few times... Because most of the time I get to the end of the level 10 story, get my key, and then I stop. <laughs> um, right, right. But, yeah, he yes, says that um, the his pod, like, floated down river. And I believe we find his pod, I think, in either Brisbane or Matrika. Matrika, Matrika? M- Matrika province, yeah. Matrika. Um... I think you find his pod in one of those. I, just I think it's meant because I was just doing it with my um, my boyfriend recently, mm-hmm. and uh, I don't know. Why I said that really quiet, like I was afraid someone was going to hear me. I'm very openly gay. <laughs> oh no! Don't mention the boyfriend. Someone will hear you. <laughs> um. Yeah, I was doing it with my boyfriend recently because he was 
running through the story for the first time. He's did he like it? One of those people. He definitely loved it, and yes. was one of those like, oh, I have to tell him that it never goes anywhere. I don't want to do that because it makes me feel bad. <laughs> it doesn't ever go anywhere. Yeah. Even though it's not even my fault. Stupid, ain't it? <laughs> Seriously. <laughs> There's literally no river that can, <laughs> yeah, that like goes from any of the Heart of Thorns maps to either of those two maps. Yeah, and I yeah. So that's, that makes it more difficult to figure out where his pod came from. Mm -hmm. But um, there's like no water in. Silver Waste or Dry Top. So, like, it would have to go through, like, the waters of the Gilded Hollow. Which <laughs> is possible. Yeah. I suppose, if you didn't understand how rivers work. <laughs> Ain't it? Just give me a, a single river. Just put a single river from any of the Heart of Thorns maps to where Malik's pot is found. Like, that's all I want. All well, that's not all I want. That's a that's a fucking lie. That's, that's one of the things that I want a lot. <laughs> yeah. You you don't you don't really give much of anything to us, ain't it? Yeah. Please. And I can like I'm also just like so upset because like even when Heart of Thorns first came out, like you could tell that there were like all those like like uh blurred out places on the map. Because you got, like, Verdant Brink, Orc Basin, and you got Tangled Depths, and, like, right next to Tangled Depths is, like, a rectangular blurry surface. Oh, yeah. And yeah. I, I always was like, oh, like, once I discovered Tangled Depths, it's like, oh, that's going to be another map. No, it's just a blank spot. And then you see, like, the whole, like, blurred out section out casually around Dragon Stand. I'm just like, mm. <laughs> Yeah. Like, I bet that's where all the Nightmare Court stuff was happening. I have no idea what happened to Malik. I know some people are just like, oh, Case probably, like, followed him and killed him. And I'm just like, that does sound like a very Case thing to do. Yeah. But she better not have. Yeah. <laughs> pretty, pretty much. Because <laughs> I'm just like, I still hate her. There, I am so glad she didn't show up in Path of Fire because I would have like having to try and deal with Bram and her at the same time. I, no, Bram wasn't even in Path of Fire. No, but so. he's been in the the living. He's story been in living story. Stuff. Yeah. Yeah. I'm also just like, where is she and what is she doing? And I don't trust her. Right. Right. Like last. I mean, she saw, should be still. Well, she. Oh, right. Well, she was in. Um, Orc Basin. Oric Basin watching over Arene, mm -hmm. which no one asked her to do. I, I take care of my dragon myself. Thank you, Kate. <laughs> I don't she's probably capable of taking care of herself. But then she showed up in um in the desert, and it was like, oh, what are you doing here, dragon? Yeah, yeah. Did, oh, how did I don't? Gosh, I'm gonna have to replay Path of Fire because I don't remember. I don't remember how Arene got in in the story, like how she. She kind of just shows up. I, yeah, I don't remember how she adulted. Or teenagered. Yeah, she kind of just shows up. Well, she gets a lot of magic from uh, something. And then she gets a lot of magic from... Um... Oh. oh, you know what it was? It was um, at, the, at the end of uh, Living Season 3 uh -huh. when you put down the... Um, when you put the dragons to sleep Yeah. and you chase Balthazar off, there's energy that goes whizzing away. At least I think that's where it comes from. I don't remember. I know no. that uh, in the final fight in the Path of Fire story, she's like trapped in something. Like, and she's up yeah, there. she's trapped in the in the in the warp. Yeah, and uh, I don't remember if you she's only... already uh, if she's still juvenile or if she's teenager. Then she's still juvenile one at that point, but she's a little bit bigger and okay. growlier and. Yeah, and I know that like when we kill that final boss i don't want to spoil it and say who it's pretty obvious but <laughs> yeah but um yeah, just in case. like and when we kill that like there's all that magic that kral katoric absorbs but then also she absorbs i'm both glad and not glad that we haven't seen case because mm -hmm. while i hate her i also don't trust her i don't trust that she's not doing something stupid 
I personally like to think that Malik is still a good guy and not dead. <laughs> yeah. Because I would love, like, for if they ever do someday release that content, I'd love for Malik to be there to, like, sort of walk us through it. Mm-hmm. Maybe he is the, 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 you know, Grand Duke of the Nightmare Court now. I don't know. <laughs> That'd actually be very interesting. It would be, considering he was, like, running from the Nightmare Court. And considering that they were, um, they were chasing him because he had the possibility of making a new Nightmare Tree. Ooh. So kind of like the whole, like, Malik loses, but also, yeah, but also he's now a really powerful character. That'd be nice. It would be. Oh, that'd be, be so be, cool. Be, be pretty cool. But would Anet do that? Probably not. No. no. <laughs> Anet, please. So I think I guess specifically what if we're if we're speculating that that was that was Malik's tree, the second tree, um, then I guess in response to the whole speculation of what happened with it when Mordremoth woke up, I would assume that it be if we're assuming that's the tree, it became blighted and yeah and uh, and fell to Mordremoth. Right. Which goes along with the whole like, assumption that the only reason uh, the Pale Tree didn't, like, fall to Mordremoth's influence when he woke up was because of the dream. Which seems to be the reason that um, most of the things that, or mo the, the, the most the, the, the Silvari that you meet don't fall to Mordremoth. Mm-hmm. It's like they're able to hold on to, like, a sense of humanity and right and wrong. Right. And moral obligation. Even if they're Nightmare Court, they still have that influence. And even though they're on the other side of that coin, they still have that inherent right. influence within them. Soundless, though. GG. Yeah. I don't know if that was ever explored in lore, or if that was just something that we sort of um, accepted as a role-playing community, that Soundless were more vulnerable to Mordremoth because they close themselves off from the dream. That was definitely um, something that the roleplay community came up with and not anything else. Makes sense. Anet, please. Yeah. So thank you, Chilled Sock, for that. Um, the next topic is actually a bunch of small topics put together uh, from someone from 2RP and, that, and she is uh, in in Cedia, in Cedia, Flora. So uh, she said, role playing empathy, like things she wanted, pe like I guess talked about was role playing empathy, how one role plays nightmare corruption, uh, soundless, uh, general things like nightmare courtiers, how they feel about M Mordremoth, how dreamers, soundless nightmare teamed up against Mordremoth, uh, and then. The second chunk was about the dream, so I'll leave that until we've talked about all the other things. <laughs> so, how do you roleplay empathy? Um, it's been different because because this guild does it differently than what I used to do. What I used to do in the first guild that I was in was that it was just a um, very specific kind of extra feeling that you would get around other people. It wasn't like a... a and it, it was it was fairly specific too. It definitely wasn't like a um, uh, kind of vague notion of what the other person was feeling. It was more like a you can practically see the anger rolling off this person. That's how strong you feel it. Mm -hmm. And it wasn't something that you could uh, really tune out either, unless you were really good. Mm -hmm. You would just always see other people's empathy um, if they were open. If that makes sense. Mm -hmm. um, that you could close it on yourself, but you couldn't close your you could you could. If you think of it like a like a set of hoses, right? Or a hose and a drain. You could close the hose, but you couldn't close the drain. You could stop showing empathy, but you couldn't stop seeing empathy. Which I don't quite know if that ever how that works. Or if it works like that. Or I, if anyone else does that. But Yeah, I think it's just dependent on the individual. Um, because I don't think, again, I don't think Anet has ever really given us any kind of lore on how Silvari empathy works other than they can feel each other's emotions and how they're feeling. <laughs> right. Um, because that's all we really 
get, and that's only from, like, NPCs. Like, there are some in the Grove who, like, this one goes up and it's just like, oh my gosh, are you okay? I can feel your hunger. Like, I'm like, man, that would be really, really horrible to just be yeah. in a popular, like, everything that everyone is feeling. Like, holy shit. Like, <laughs> Like, I am pretty, like, in tune with other people's, like, emotions, like, personally. So, like, going into, like, crowded spaces and, like, all that stuff and everything like that is kind of draining and taxing on me. So, I can just imagine if it's, like, literally every feeling from everybody Mm -hmm. all the time. Yeah, Yeah, that'd be... Hell, I think, would be a bit of an understatement. Yeah. (laughs) And just, like... And that's just how it is from the day you wake up. And I'm just like, no, I do not want that. No wonder they're soundless. Yeah. Yeah, I... I've sort of seen people, like, do it all differently. Like, I... My personal thing, like, with my characters is, like, yeah, you can train uh, to be able to, like, control your empathy and close it off or uh, show things that you want people to see, sort of, like, deceptive empathy um, and things like that. But that takes a lot of, like practice and like lessons and dedication to actually get to that point like Mm -hmm. I think when Lily was learning it she like it act of like gosh it was months of active RP lessons to get her to the point of she could like close her empathy off like and not show anything and in RP speak several months is like feels like years because oh, yeah. things tend to move quickly in RP because otherwise people get bored <laughs> right so something that takes like a long time and is very slow going uh, is not necessarily appealing to a lot of people so yeah and like for Andrin she's god she's like 13 years old now <laughs> And when I started playing her, she was 10, and I'm just like, in her 10 years that I haven't played her, I'm pretty sure she'd learned how to do it, so Mm -hmm. I didn't have to actively do that again, thank God. Right, yeah. (laughs) Lily pretty much keeps herself, her, her empathy is more muted rather than closed off. And, like, when I close off her empathy, I'll emote that her empathy shuts down. Or, well, not shuts down, right. but, like, closes off. Um, right. But otherwise, she doesn't mind feeling other people's empathy. She mostly uses that technique for if she's outside of court or needs to blend in or is go- is going to be somewhere where there's dreamers. Not that it- she even really has to because apparently everyone thinks she's a dreamer anyway. Whereas with so so Lily will will still even even though her empathy is like closed down, she'll still sort of like feel things or be responsive to other people's empathy. Andrin's is more just constantly shut down, like constantly closed and closed behind all of her mental defenses. And because that's how she sort of, like, structures her mind and everything, I have it so that that's why she doesn't feel empathy off of others. Because it's not just that she's closed her empathy. It's sort of she's withdrawn within herself and Mm -hmm. has all these shenanigans going on in her friggin' head. Right. Empathy is complicated. (laughs) Empathy is a very complicated subject, yeah. If you're gonna RP empathy, make sure that what you're picking up on is something specifically put down by the other player. So that's empathy. <laughs> yeah. That's, um, uh, yeah, that's, that's empathy. Yeah, I mean, I kind of, I kind of feel like it's, it's gotta be definitely something, it's gotta, it's, you, if, if you're new to this sort of thing and you're trying to, to keep it, uh, more realistic, just relate it back to human empathy. It's never something that you can intensely feel. Even when you're kind of overwhelmed by it, it's still something that's just like, a presence in the back of your mind. Mm-hmm. But yeah, so next section. <laughs> right, next section. Finally. Is how one role plays nightmare corruption. Ooh, okay, this is a good one. 
I like this question already. I haven't even answered it. I don't even know <laughs> if I'm going to answer it, but I like it already. For for my character, for for Grick Love, for those that are unaware of who I am, again, because I haven't been, I wasn't in the last one. I don't think it was definitely. Um, it was a very slow and kind of insidious change in thought pattern, because there, were, I suppose, at the base of it, this sort of idea that that like some of the things that that uh, Ventari taught were and the Pale Tree taught were just not quite fit for the real world. The whole like show only kindness, mm -hmm. the brother has blossomed to the weed, the vigils like that's bull nonsense. Old nonsense? What the? <laughs> yeah. Say fuck, but censor shit. You know, who even gives a shit? <laughs> okay. I've been, I'm, I, I, I work around kids is why. That's, <laughs> I appreciate the effort to make this family friendly. <laughs> you're welcome. Um, but, but it, so, so yeah, and especially with, um, with the whole thing into ore as well, where Zyten was, was definitely a weed that had to be put down. You could not be like, just dealt with kind of kindly. Mm -hmm. I don't know. Did we ever try inviting him over for dinner? Did we ever once no, ask Zaitan what he wanted? You have a good point. Oh, well, actually, we did. Um, it was magic and death. Oh, okay. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. We didn't ask. We didn't invite him over, but we did ask the mouth what it wanted, and the mouth was like to eat everything. Okay. Um, well, see, that's the mouth, though. <laughs> if you ask mouth... your mouth what it wants, it might say the same <laughs> thing. <laughs> That's you know you have a good point. <laughs> you do have a good point. I don't think I think if I gave my mouth, uh, you know, a, a separate body to walk around and eat things, <laughs> it probably would only think about eating things. Yeah. Um, but yeah. So it was it was definitely like a um. It starts off by just being placed in a bad situation. Mm -hmm. That's that's not the character's fault. Mm -hmm. There's nothing the character could have done differently. In this case, in my case, it was crash landing in the jungle and then losing the rest of his friends and crewmates to a mordrum. And then the next part would be doubting some of the beliefs that you have. Like, um, maybe if I had done something differently, I would have been able to change things. Mm -hmm. And that's definitely, in my opinion, a big part of, if, if only I had been better, I wouldn't be in this terrible situation. Mm -hmm. I, I'm realizing now that I think a lot, a lot of it, uh, about it a lot like the dark side of the force. Mm-hmm. Where it's this thing that's like, if you need more power, it's there. You know what it does to you. You know it corrupts. You know it, in theory, it's bad. But if you're stuck in a really awful situation, you have no other way out, it's there. Mm -hmm. So for, once you start, once, you, once the character starts doubting their original beliefs, that, for example, that the world is, is mostly good, that they deserve good things, there's the, the new character in our guild that is essentially a poisoner. And one of the big beliefs that Greg had to help break her out of was that poisoning people is is something that's wrong. That it's that there's a morality to the world. I think I think is the best way to describe that. That once she started doubting that that the world has morality, then why should she have morality? The the nettles don't aren't wrong because they sting someone. They just do. Mm -hmm. So if, if you are designed to poison, you shouldn't feel bad about poisoning. For the record, poisoning people is bad. Please don't do it. Oh yes, yes. <laughs> I mean, uh, yeah, thanks. You know, yeah. just make sure you put that out where I don't want to go to jail or anything. Yeah. Um, this yeah, is all in the fantasy mind realm. Yeah, don't I was take any of this into the real world. I was recording a Dragon Age thing a while back, and my elf that I was playing was uh, I'm I'm doing my Bad Warden playthrough, and she's basically killing everybody, and she hates humans like with a passion. So there was this mm -hmm. one choice I had to make. And I'm, like, going through her thought process, but I'm speaking as her. And, like, yep. I'm going through, and I'm just, like, talking about how, like, trying to basically justify this d decision that I know she's going to end up making. And, like, maybe also trying to talk her out of it. But, like, I'm talking as her, and talking about all the people that I've killed. And as I'm talking, I'm like, wait a minute. Let me just clarify that I'm talking as my elf. <laughs> yeah. And that I have not actually killed anyone. <laughs> <laughs> mm -hmm. So even though like it's it's probably obvious, I don't probably want, being I, a keyword. Yeah, yeah, I don't want cops showing up at my door because of something I post on YouTube. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> but yep. yeah, sorry, go on. <laughs> yeah, so so for this for this this character that's become essentially a poisoner or has maybe become a I, I haven't been on the guild in a while. Probably mm -hmm. 
for this character, there was a lot of guilt about the the thing that she does because it's not a good thing. It's not something that that life follows mm-hmm. or that brings life. And so you had to you had to first get her in a bad enough position that that she thinks that the whole morality of the world is 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 somewhat wrong. That she doesn't deserve what's happening to her, but it's happening to her nonetheless. Mm-hmm. And then that, secondly, that her morality is wrong, specifically, because it doesn't help her. And then finally, it was a matter of th- the morality doesn't matter to only I matter. That once you become sort of a selfish character, that's the the full nightmare transition, in my opinion. Mm-hmm. Um, that there are nightmare characters that obviously work for larger goals and other people, but as a whole, in my opinion, the, the actual act of conversion starts with going from a position of believing in the world, morality being good, to ending up with uh, morality doesn't matter, only I do. Mm-hmm. If I'm surviving, then that's good. If I'm not surviving, that's bad, and I should do whatever I can to fix that. And then from there, you just that's 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 fully corrupted in my opinion. But you can get worse by going like, oh well, you know, if it's not just my survival that matters, it's the whole survival race that needs, that's the, the that needs to survive. Um, I was too weak before I was nightmare, so obviously the other Silvari are also too weak as dreamers, and they need to be converted to nightmare for the whole race to survive. Mm-hmm. And anywhere along that path, you can kind of lose this sort of I don't want to say fake. Nightmare, because it's, it's still a real nightmare, but it's, it's more of like a... You don't fully believe it's Nightmare, if that makes sense. Or at least mm-hmm. Griklov didn't fully believe it was Nightmare for a while. It's sort of like how you're you're in denial, like, no, the yeah. Nightmare it, are horrible people, they do horrible things, and I don't do horrible things, so right. I'm obviously I'm doing what's not, best. Yeah, I'm obviously right. not a courtier, even though, right. God, I think even Strice is a good example of that, the character... Like, yeah. because he did horrible things, like, especially mm-hmm. towards the end of his time in the court, like, and he was still maintaining that he was not a courtier, even though he manipulated and did these horrible things to these completely innocent individuals for no reason other than his own personal benefit and enjoyment and gain. Mm-hmm. Like... And then he, like, killed them. Like, <laughs> in his mind, the one was begging for death because she didn't want to be tortured anymore. She didn't want to to embrace Nightmare. And she didn't want to, to convert. And so she was begging him to kill her. And so he sees it as a mercy killing. But, like, you know, he's, he gave her what she wanted. And, you know, he feels remorse and guilt about that. But it's also like, dude... You put this girl through so much hell that she begged you to kill her, and you slit her fucking throat. Like, mm-hmm. like yeah, y- you are a courtier. No, I'm not. Yes, you are. <laughs> mm-hmm. Like, yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, and I, I think that's yeah, that's exactly what I was going for. Is the the whole idea that yeah, once you start working towards yourself and forget about the morality of it all, you become a courtier, whether you realize it or whether you yeah whether you're in denial or not you become a courtier mm-hmm. but it doesn't mean you should stop you know doing the conversion stuff because that's still a lot of fun it's being like look you just did a horrible thing mm-hmm. you're a horrible person no i'm not i'm doing this for good reasons i think probably deep down grick still believes that he's doing things for good reasons as well uh-huh. he hasn't he hasn't fully abandoned that idea of i'm actually doing this to help people mm-hmm. um and not the <laughs> the selfish reasons of I felt powerless, so now I want to never feel that again. You pretty much like said everything that I was gonna say, so I like I don't have much more to add to that. <laughs> Yo, I'm sorry. No, it's good. It's fine. The logical arguments that basically all of my characters use, because Cassidius does not torture to convert; he only converts via logic, um, because that's how he was brought in. He was brought in of his own accord with a very logical mindset uh, mm-hmm. that I mean I guess Cassidius would be the best one to talk about with this because he he was a warden he fought against Nightmare and in his backstory his group of wardens slow, like progressively got so 
obsessed with hunting nightmare courtiers that they were seeing nightmare in places where there was no nightmare. And they were arresting people who were not courtiers. And they were so convinced that these people were courtiers that they were just executing them without any evidence. And so Casadilla saw this and he's just like, this is wrong. This is not, you know, I'm going along with it because I'm following orders, but this is completely wrong. And I know that this Mm -hmm. is wrong. And if we're doing this to innocent people, how does that make us any different from the people we're supposed to be protecting them from? Right. And so he's just like, this This is not right. And he saw in a cell, he saw someone who actually was a courtier, but it was a very young sapling, um, like about less than a year old. And this 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 kid had been, kid, <laughs> this uh, Silvari had been in the grove for uh, a couple of weeks. Uh, just going around and learning because they just wanted to learn how to fight, how basically how to person. Like they just wanted to learn basic skills that they didn't see. They didn't feel like they could learn anywhere other than the grove. And even though they were a courtier, they they came in. They hid their empathy really well because they were trained to do that. And they weren't hurting anybody they weren't attacking anybody they were just taking lessons and learning and that's all they wanted and Mm -hmm. so Casidius had seen them over those couple weeks and then suddenly they're in a cell and the the (laughs) Silvari had you know hadn't denied that they were a courtier but also was not giving up any information about uh about their court and was sentenced to execution And Cassidius is just like, (laughs) we're killing innocent dreamers, and this courtier is just going to die just because of their political affiliation, basically. They weren't hurting anybody. They weren't doing anything. This is just a scared child. Like, this this is ridiculous. And that was, like, the turning point for him. So he basically broke the Silvari out and helped them escape because he's just like, there's no point in killing someone, killing any more good people. Like, this is, this is fucking ridiculous. And so he basically turned on his squad and helped this kid escape. And I keep saying kid, Silvari. <laughs> mm-hmm. Um... And then basically sought refuge with the court because once you help a courtier escape the grove and execution, you kind of don't really have a chance of being a warden anymore. (laughs) Um, So he was just like, you know, Cassidius is very like, I know what is right. I know what is wrong. And he doesn't see necessarily dream and nightmare. He just sees right and wrong. And what was going on in the Grove was wrong. And yeah, there are a lot of things that happen in in the Nightmare Court that is also wrong. But at least they own it. (laughs) At least they stand up and say, I'm a piece of shit but I know I'm a piece of shit. Whereas the wardens right. he was working with were just like, no, we're doing this for the tablet. We're doing this for the tree. This is what we're meant to do. This is our mission mm-hmm. and our goal, and we are righteous. And he's just like, nah, y'all are murderers. That's like all you're doing. You're not doing anything good. So right. he, at that point, he was just like, if, if the tablet and the dream makes people think that they can justify horrible acts because because they're doing it in the name of goodness therefore their actions must inherently be good yeah. then then I want none of it and if I'm going to be doing bad things which he was then I'll I'll do it in the name of actually doing bad things to eventually get our people to a point where they don't act like that anymore because the tablet is ridiculous and just in just creates this mob mentality for people so mm-hmm. he's just very much anti-dream and tablet now um just because he's like i'm i'm done with that shit but that being but, said, he also stays away from excessive violence or he does like the only time he kills people 
is when they're directly threatening him or the people he has sworn to protect, like the court or stuff like that. Um, and he, when he does kill them, it's not like, oh, I'm killing this person because they're a dreamer or I'm killing this person because they're, you know, they're not nightmare or whatever. I'm doing it to protect these people. Right. So, so yeah. So I think that for me, I sort of play the, the corruption as, I guess, like a crisis of morality. The way I personally see Nightmare and the way my characters see it is, like, that other side of the coin. And like you had said, it's like, you know, the dark side of the force. Like, it's, you can't have good without having the equal and opposite bad or light v dark so because i think that and you see this in literally every society and every culture there is nothing who is just 100 percent good all the time and pure and light with no dark because then you have an unbalance and I think that thinking that is more, thinking that that is possible is thinking more of like a utopian society, which we can never achieve. Like, because there's always going to be people who can't do that. Or, you know, everyone has that one part of them that is going to be selfish in certain situations. Like, we, like, that's just how it, that's just how people are. No one is 100% good all of the time. Everyone does bad things. It's just, right. what do you consider to, to be too far? Um, and then just bulldozing right past that line if you're a courtier. <laughs> yeah. It's almost like thinking that you can get communism to work in a good way. Like, communism on paper is pretty good, but in practice, not so much because it doesn't work and you can't have just the dream it's not going to work because nobody no society is going to have 100 percent of the population working together for a single common goal (laughs) Mm -hmm. like it's it's not going to happen you're always going to have those those outliers who don't agree with the goal because we all have free will we all have multiple aspects of ourselves and right i feel like the dreamers in the grove just ignore the fact that they have their own wants and desires they're just like tablet forever tablet is wonderful always follow the tenants and or whatever or they like lock themselves up in the grove where they're isolated in this like bubble and it's sort of like the further you get from the grove, the more you see that the world is shit and that your your views will change accordingly. And I think that Nightmare is sort of like the natural progression of that. Like once you realize that the, n- everything is not the way that you thought it was, that everything is not the way that you were told and taught and life is not peaches and cream and strawberries on pretty summer days, like that's not how the world works, then you start questioning everything else, and then your whole, like, structure that you were basically born under just crumbles and falls apart. Right. That's pretty much how my characters all get converted. Well, Lily. Like I said, Cassidius did it on his own, and Andrin was chased out of the grove, so. (laughs) Mm -hmm. But, but yeah. Uh, next was, uh, how do Nightmare Courtiers feel about Mordremoth? Uh, okay. So, I mean, let's just get the ball rolling with, um, the fact that, like, the, some of the good parts about Mordremoth, right? Um, There's good parts. It, it, to Courtiers, sort of, as a whole, sort of, um, it was a, it was a huge shake-up for, um, just the morality of the Pale Tree as a whole. Mm-hmm. Um, it was a it was a big eye-opening event for every Silvari when Mordremoth woke up. Mm-hmm. Um, that the world is not as it as you thought it was, which, as we talked about earlier, is is a big part of turning into a court. You are not a good person. You are a dragon minion. Um, and then so after that happens, you, a whole bunch of people from the the pact got sent into the jungle 
and end up in horrible, horrible situations. There's another piece of the turning courtier bit. A lot of that horrible situation was having friends and allies turn against you. There was a lot of this, at least from what I've seen in the story and from what I've seen in some other role players, there was a lot of, though mainly I role play with courtiers. So what I saw with the people that I role play with and a little bit from the story is that it was a lot of your friends and allies turn against you. And 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 your not just your human allies and your your non Silvari allies, but your Silvari allies as well start to turn against you. And so there's really this moment of like, oh yeah. So there's 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 the thought of like, oh well, you know, the people who turned Mordrum must not have been as strong as I was, as I am. Mm-hmm. Um, must not have been. They just they just didn't have the mental fortitude. Right. The willpower. The willpower. Um, and then of course as the story goes on, if you're playing a Silvari commander. Mordermoth continues to whisper into your ear louder and louder and louder. At first, the commander's kind of like, yeah, whatever. Mm-hmm. Get on my head, you grumpy old lizard. <laughs> and by the end, it's kind of just like a it does, it's not even you. And there's that, that one spot at, I think one of the last instances where if you're a Silvari commander, you actually you actually are fighting with oh, the yeah. Mordrum yeah. against your yeah. friends or whatever. Yeah. yeah. Um, and you have to break that connection. Like, at one point, you do succumb, and it's like, oh, holy shit. Like, you still have your consciousness and your mentality, and you're like, wait, no, this is wrong, but you're not fully in control of yourself. Right. And I do love that. That's one thing they did do right with that entire expansion. Yeah. One thing. So, <laughs> so what I'm saying is the, the good part about Mortremoth and, and the Nightmare Court is that it for those of the Nightmare Court that survived, um, there was a lot of new members from the Dreamers that that were turned courtier by Mordremoth. Um, I, yeah, I feel like bit. just that whole thing with Mordremoth did shake up <coughs> like everything to do with like the Dream because people were suddenly forced to question their thoughts and their entire existence once it came out that they were dragon minions. And then everyone treating them differently. <clears throat> just, I feel like that was just sort of like, like I know that we were talking about like the whole like questioning your morality or whatever. Like, yeah, like I think that that's, it sort of forced people to do that. I think the Nightmare Court, while they probably also hated Mordremoth as a whole, <laughs> um, were probably grateful for that traumatic event just because it did stir things up and it did like mm-hmm. it did sh- it did shake things up a lot and I think that was beneficial for Nightmare so they're gonna like that because that's right the they've always point. been about the shake up they've, yeah. they've always been about the kind of trying to turn the established order on its head mm-hmm. but like from a character standpoint like I think Cassidius is pretty neutral I don't think he really has an opinion on Mordremoth because uh, he wasn't really involved in anything regarding Mordremoth. He was alive at the time. He was just in Sparkfly Fen dealing with Wardens and Risen. <laughs> so... Yeah. Um, and that's... Let me check my map again. That's... Uh, Sparkfly Fen is kind of a distance away from from the jungle and Mordremoth. Uh, yeah. compared to, like, Caledon and all the other places we'll, where Silvari tend to be. So, he wasn't as affected by it. Uh, Andrin deliberately stayed away from all things related to Mordremoth because she got to the Silver Wastes, because um, her court at the time was before... Uh, it was right after Mordremoth rose, but no one really knew... That he had he had woke up, um, because it was like right, right there was after the, there Scar- was the yeah it was like right, right after there was that Scarlet. scream there's that scream after Scarlet's machine went off that yeah. resonated through the world and it was like wait what yeah so and then like all the stuff in the silver waste started happening and that stuff was active and so her court was investigating the the stuff in silver waste and so Andrew went out there and because she's so sensitive to magic and you know things like that. And she does view magic as something that's inherently beautiful. So she's just automatically drawn to it. um, Just because of her own, you know, wants and desires. Uh, So she was like, 
drawn towards these like Mordremoth tendrils, I guess, or like the vines that are emanating magic. And she mm-hmm. like had to be physically pulled away from it because she wanted she wanted to go deeper. She wanted to know more. She wanted to continue going. Uh, right. And in that once she came back to her senses and she found like once she was informed that, oh, you know, Mordremoth is actually awake and so on and so forth and stuff in the jungle, she really wanted nothing to do with it because she kind of put two and two together that that's probably the same kind of magic. <laughs> Mm-hmm. And sh- if she was basically so quick to succumb to it in the Silver Wastes, she probably wouldn't stand a chance out in the jungle with the dragon yeah. alive and awake. And so she's just like, no thank you. <laughs> so she stayed as far away from that as she could. And she even doesn't like, uh, I think... Uh, Cowlin took them to Verdant Brink to collect something uh, and she didn't like it she didn't want to go you know for multiple reasons like you know that right. terrain is not for heels and she wears heels everywhere and you know she can't look important things you know yeah like you can't look fashionable in the jungle Cowlin like god and she's just like, not only that, but, you know, Mordremoth was here, and <laughs> I didn't want to be here before, I don't want to be here now. <laughs> I mean, technically Mordremoth was also there in, you know, Paladin Forest, and the Grove. It's different. <laughs> Like, I feel like the way that most people uh, played it is, like, the closer you were to Dragon Stand, the, the louder. Oh, yeah, for, more, for and, sure. Yeah, so, like, that's... that's yeah, that's how the game played it as well. Yeah, so that's what that's what she meant. And she's just like, no, I just want to go back to Divinity's Reach, where there's people and cobblestone, and I can wear my shoes. <laughs> that's uh, great. And Lily actually was in the jungle during the well what i i guess call the war <laughs> um yep. during that time because nikea was uh hearing the dragon and was you know really affected by it and lily was never really affected by it until they got into the jungle uh, then mm. she started hearing it, and she's just like, this is ridiculously weird and uncomfortable, and I do not like it. Um, but she was pretty she was pretty good about, like, resisting until they got into Dragon Stand with the pact, and then it was just like, oh my god, this is so overwhelming. <laughs> yeah. Uh, and it was a, really difficult for her, but she she managed to, to deal with it, and she actually, she and Corrin and Nakea... Um, were with the pact when they assaulted the mouth of Mordremoth. Um, mm. So she was like, saw, she was just screaming. <laughs> she was just yeah. like, she was not a happy camper. It also didn't help that we were like doing the meta in character. That's supposed to be the like assault. Um, right. So like we were doing that in character and Lily was just like, what the actual fuck? Yeah. And then they got to, like, the the last bit where you actually see the mouth. And she's just like, I'm going to die. <laughs> yeah. And and then he's, like, breaking up islands. And, of course, he was breaking up the one that she was on. She started screaming. <laughs> and she was just like, nope, nope, nope. <laughs> she mm-hmm. somehow, she, because she, I didn't have her, like, in character gliding is not a thing for her because oh oh no yeah because like okay here's my thought side tangent on gliding in character especially with with specifically with lily um i don't have a problem with people gliding in character i mean live your dreams if your character has a glider more power to them but lily carries a bow and a quiver on her back at all times she doesn't have space on her back for a fucking glider so yeah and i don't i don't Mm, I don't like the fact that, like, y- it, when people play, like, gliders, like, are compl- are just, like, you know, 
not there or whatever until you need them and then whoosh i've got a glider like where was it how did you right. how did you deploy it that's basically having a fucking parachute like a mechanical parachute on your back at all times like no <laughs> Right, right. So, so yeah, and you know, because Lily has her bow and her quiver, and she also always has, um, uh, you know, melee weapons on her hips, and she's also covered in daggers that, you know, most of the time they're not seen. She keeps, like, her hunting knife is visible, because uh, that's on one of her hips. But all of her other daggers are hidden, um, and... So I'm just like, she's not gonna shove a glider on her back. How is she gonna carry her bow if she has to switch yeah. to melee? Where is she gonna put her bow? Like, right. So, so she does not glide in character, and so luckily I was able to like scramble her over to um, the 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 one bit that did not crumble and fall. <laughs> right. But she was not about it. She was not a happy camper. <laughs> And then, uh, luckily, she managed to to get portaled to other islands. Because I was just like, okay, I can accept that if NPC mesmers are porting people from damaged right. islands. Like, okay. Yeah. <laughs> so, so that's how she got to safety. But, yeah, so that was not a fun time for her. <laughs> yeah, the point I was, I was making is that if you've got a personal experience with, with Mortremont, um as a safari, no matter who you were, it was an unpleasant experience. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, you either you either were a, you either turned Mordrum or you had an unpleasant experience. Those were the two options. Uh, what do you think about how the Dreamers, Soundless, and Nightmare teamed up against Mordramoth? It feels wrong to say this about Safari, but it's a it's a it's a very human thing. Mm -hmm. The enemy of my enemy is my friend, regardless of what their intentions were before then. Mm -hmm. And so. When you have an enemy that could literally destroy your entire race, it doesn't matter what you feel of the people, the, per the person right next to you. It doesn't matter what they felt of you 30 seconds before you learned about this person who could destroy your entire race. Yeah. Yeah, it's like... I think, all, like, it wasn't even... At that point, it's not a political issue anymore. Like, you don't care about your politics. You just you know something is trying to destroy your entire race so you're going to you're going to all work together to stop that and you can go back to hating each other tomorrow <laughs> and i and i feel like there was there was also a lot of opportunity to um to uh try and do some conversions as well on both sides of the of the spectrum mm -hmm. but there was a lot of like look at the world is terrible come be nightmare and there was also a lot of you'd be safer if you were under the protection of our mother don't be soundless anymore please <laughs> I suppose that brings up a, 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 a second like a question which mm -hmm. is sort of um, more of my question to you mm -hmm. um, Andrin what do you feel about the finality of converting to Nightmare just in general you just in, yeah because I've always felt that it's 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 it sort of makes sense but not entirely mm -hmm. because it seems like it, there's there's a there's a, a strange like dichotomy of, of, of two aspects of nightmare, right? Mm -hmm. That there's the, um, the 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 primary aspect, which is the the selfish aspect. The I'm I'm going to become more powerful for myself. I'm going to disregard morality. I'm going to disregard the rules because rules only hold us back. And there's the second aspect that I feel like is often ignored, which is to try and taint the dream with horrible memories mm -hmm. that the, the more suffering and anguish you can put into the dream, you know, the more well-rounded the dream will be mm -hmm. for future Slavari. Yeah. Trying to counteract all the, all the good thoughts uh, that are in the dream. So that, that, that right. The courtiers feel are, are kind of fake thoughts. They're, yeah, they're not adequate, adequately preparing the, 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 saplings for the real world yeah and it's sort of like you know when when the saplings wake up they're automatically inherently of the dream and the whole point is to well i guess it also depends on who you talk to whereas some courtiers 
uh, will say that the point is so that when Silvari wake up, they're not tied to either dream or nightmare. They're free to make their own choice about who they want to be. Um, right. whereas others are just like, nah, man, like when they wake up, they need to be nightmare because that's the way of the world. Right. So I think that's just. Right. But there's, there's, so there's, so there's, um, but the, then kind of on top of that idea of converting the dream to nightmare as a, as a entity inside the pale tree, mm-hmm. um, through the memories and whatnot, mm-hmm. there's also this aspect of once you become a courtier, you can't ever become a dreamer again. Yeah. Um, even though you clearly can never fully sever your connection to the pale tree. Mm-hmm. Um, even as a soundless, the pale tree can still feel you just kind of faintly, I think yeah. it's described. Yeah, and as Nightmare, you're obviously still connected to the dream because you're feeding into it. <laughs> right, right, exactly. So there's this, there, I, I don't, I've never quite understood why you can't come back from being Nightmare. I think that um, that's more of a philosophical standpoint, that once you reject the te- the tenants in the tablet, once you accept that, or quote, quote, accept, that they are full of shit and that that's not the way of the world, you can't trick yourself into thinking that, that, oh no, I was wrong. That is how the world works. The world mm. really is sunshine and rainbows and you know, the tenants are great. Like, you can't... What, sort of like once you've had your eyes opened, uh, speaking... Uh, I guess sort of speaking with the mentality of a courier because those are the characters that I play, so that's what I'm used to. Right. Um, right. Once you've had your eyes open to that, you can't... You can't close them again. Sort of like right. once you've gone out in the world and you've seen just the horrible things that people do to each other, the horrible state of the... the the planet just once you've seen with your own eyes how shitty everything is you can't actually fully uh just ignore all of that because you've seen it you've experienced it you can't go back to the state of ignorance you can't become naive again yeah so Um. so i think that's what they mean uh in that once you go nightmare you can't go back But I think that the way that it's portrayed in, like, the story is with very extreme outliers. (laughs) Like, you see it with with Kate and Teokrin and his love, where she's just like, no, once once she's fallen to Nightmare, she's not coming back. And and Teokrin's dear heart is just fucking crazy. (laughs) Yeah. And... It's like I wish that they would show more courtiers like um like Gavin because he I feel is more of the the norm whereas all the the courtiers that you see in the story and I mean it makes sense because the nightmare court is supposed to be you know that enemy um you know it's like the um it's like the white mantle to the humans. It's like the flame legion for the Char and the uh, inquest for the Asura. Like every culture or race in Tyria has their own uh, evil subset. So the court, Nightmare Court is supposed to be that evil subset. They're, you're not supposed to identify with them or like them. So of course right. they're going to show you the, the more extreme ones. Uh, but then they do show you Gavin, and that just fucking throws everything off. <laughs> but, um... Yeah, I feel like they did it in the human story a little bit as well. They show you some bandits that are not evil. Yeah. Yeah, and so... But not the Asura, or the Norn, or the Well, Char. they kind of have recently, like in the living story, you've got um, Gorik and Blish who are in quest, but they're also, they also come work for you, because they are... I did forget about Gorg and Blish, yeah. yeah. Um, I was thinking more just base story, but yeah, yeah. In, the, in the Path of Fire there is some in quests that are not evil. And then, um... But which which like, I do, which I do really like, the, the, the evil characters not, or the evil class of characters not having evil people in them. Yeah. Because, I mean, if you look at the, kind of the original thoughts concept blurbs 
or Guild Wars 2, mm -hmm. there was this whole feeling of like every race is at each other's throats and there's there's no cooperation ever and you need to, you know, band mm -hmm. together to finally defeat these this, these evil things that have woken up. And there definitely was not any of that in the original story. Mm -hmm. It was kind of like, oh, yeah, we don't really like you because we don't really like you, but I guess we'll work together because there are zombies right there and I don't like zombies worse than I don't like you. <laughs> yeah. I don't remember what your original question was. Something about the Neither version. do I. Um, I, was I was asking you about the inability to turn... Oh, right, I remember now. It was um, talking about uh, during the fight on Mortremoth how Dreamer, Silence, and Nightmare banded together to fight Mortremoth. Mm -hmm. And I was talking about how there's possibility for conversion mm -hmm. on both sides, but then I was like, wait a minute, Dreamers can't convert. <laughs> well, I think the Dreamers would be more like... Obviously, they wouldn't be going for the courtiers. I think they'd be going for the soundless. Being like, look, you guys have cut yourselves off completely. And look at all these people who were fighting who were not connected uh, to the dream. Because I think at that point, there's no denying that there are other trees and other like groups of Silvari out there in the world. Like, yeah. There's no more denying that. There's no more hiding that Malik existed. Well, I mean, there is. Yeah, I, but I mean, like, because no, no one actually interacted with him that, quote unquote, matters in the general population. Like, they see these trees, they see these pods, they know that they're like the ones in the grove. Like, they they see them. Like, right, right. You were. This is this less of like a. Um, please come back and more of like you were given an incredible gift to be born in the grove mm -hmm. and to cast that away is, is foolishness mm -hmm. yeah like we can protect you better you can protect yourself better if you reconnect um and i feel like some of the because there are i mean i assume that there are um dreamers out there who are not you know basically hippies and sunshine and rainbows that make me sick right like, right. so I feel like some dreamers would even just be like, dude, pick a side. I don't even care what side. Just pick a side. Like, right. just don't be soundless right now. <laughs> I feel like that's what would happen. And then on that same, in that same vein, I feel like there would also be some courtiers who would just literally be like, literally just pick a side, but pick ours. Like, <laughs> yeah. yeah, ours is obviously better, but just pick a side. Like Lily personally, if put in that situation wouldn't care if someone chose to be a dreamer she'd just be like this is not safe for you you need to just just connect with the dream in some manner just just connect so that you'll yeah. be safer my, my poor sweet summer child <laughs> right i feel like nightmare court probably would have used that um to their advantage a lot more than dreamers maybe I mean, I mean, yeah. You look at you look at um, Grand Duchess Fowlin, and she is doesn't really interact with Kate much, honestly. But she uses um, the kind of shitty situation she's in to kind of try and push her own standing higher. It's it's less of like a we'll band together now, and more of like a see you later, bitches. You deal with that fucking monster while I run the fuck away. Mm -hmm. So I feel like as a, as a whole, the Nightmare Court does more embody that than. Everyone stand with each other, shoulder to shoulder, while we watch the apocalypse together. I wish that that would have been explored more, and I feel like that would have been explored more if they hadn't cut that whole chunk out. <laughs> like maybe but we we'll would have never know. Yeah, maybe we would have seen more of that. I don't know if it's like duality of the Nightmare Court, where it's like. Like, or maybe more like variety in the individuals because yeah. Duchess Chrysanthia is, she seems like yeah, a really nice lady. Yeah, she's standing there, she helps out, yeah. Yeah, like she does her part, uh, she's there fighting the good fight and, and everything and she's not trying to double cross anybody, she's not trying to stab anyone in the back, like she's working for the cause. And you assume that if she's the leader of, I would assume, her own little court, um, that her courtiers would follow in her footsteps. Because obviously, yeah. like, if, if they step out of line, she's going to fuck them up. Uh, right. Because that's how nightmare courts work. <laughs> yeah. Um, so, I mean, and that's a lot different than, like... For example, Fowlin, who is constantly 
trying to use whatever, like you said, whatever situation she's in to push her own agenda. Like, not once, even though we only see Duchess Chrysanthia for literally maybe, like, three tiny interactions. <laughs> um, right. Like, she's not... When you talk to her as a Silvari, she's not saying, hey, you know, it's good to see you again. You should... Have you thought about joining the Nightmare Court? Like... <laughs> Right. You know, she's not tr like, and even after the, you know, Mordremoth is dead at the very end when you're looting and everything, she's up there with all the other NPCs. She's still not trying to push her agenda. She's just like, oh, well fought. You know, you did, you did good. I hope to see you again sometime. Like, whereas if it were Fallon, Fallon would literally just be like, fuck everything else that is going on. Let's talk about your politics. Like,. Right. So, and especially well, if you're Kate. <laughs> right. I feel like, especially if you one of these things, like, okay, you've got two options. Mm -hmm. You either join Nightmare or I toss you off this island. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> or I will feed you to Mordramoth myself. <laughs> right. Exactly. So, so, yeah. So, it's like, I would have loved to even just learn more about Duchess Chrysanthia. Because I feel like she, mm, I almost want to say she's probably a lot like, like Gavin in that they're not the worst of the worst that we've been experienced to and they could give some better insight into just the complexity of the nightmare court because the nightmare court is incredibly complicated <laughs> yeah the like, reason what we're saying is ain't it please mm -hmm. just ain't it please ain't it please please i will when i uh. make this video i'm gonna tweet ain't it <laughs> <laughs> yes, please. Ain't it, please? They're not like, gonna listen to the whole thing, I know, but still. <laughs> just, just add in more, you know. I forget what they're called already. Short stories. Uh. Current events. Current events. Um, Don't even get me started on current events, man. I still want to finish the stupid Shadowstone stuff that we that we never got to finish. <sighs> Yeah. Like what happened? We we that was no longer... so exciting too. I know. There's like crowds of people trying to figure out those stupid portals in the middle of whatever it was Char territory. Yeah. They dumped you in the lake if you got it wrong. Mm -hmm. You spend like hours there. Yeah, it's like, and you have like you choose this option, and I love that they they put that in where you you make a choice. I don't like that it's per account and that you can only do it once per account because like the choice yeah. I make with Lily would be a different choice I would make with Andron. But that's the that's the most what they get for tying it to achievements, not the storybook. Yeah. But, yeah. I mean, now it's just sitting in my inventory, and yep. in, my, in one of my mule characters, just yeah. sitting there. I have I just have it on Lily. I'm like, someday this will be useful again. That's like I wish mm -hmm. I wish I hadn't have run into that that glowing anomaly man because <laughs> the first time, like at first, he, I remember like he was just standing there, like off in the distance, and it was kind of creepy. And then suddenly he started doing emotes. <laughs> like he, wait, like, like the the big one? No, not the or big the little, one. The little one that starts the quest. Yeah. The little one that starts the quest. He started doing emotes. Yeah, he did like the surprised. He like would jump in the air and look sh like shocked. And uh, huh. and he also like uh, w like sometimes would just show up and he would be hunched over looking sad, um, like like the slash sad. And um, there were others where what did he do? I think at one he shrugged. And the first time he did that was really, it really freaked me out because I only saw it like out of the corner of my eye, like off in the distance on my on my camera. And he, like, he jumped, and he was, like, caught up in a tree because I was in the guild hall. And I'm like, um, is that normal? <laughs> <laughs> Man. It's like, my, my anomaly guy, uh, he, he, he jumped, and he's in a tree. <laughs> <laughs> That's hilarious. So, uh, but yeah, and then, like, you run into him, and then that's, that starts the quest, and then that's the last you see of him, and I miss him. And I'm just like, and then, like, all this shit happens. Like, you basically explode and become an, an anomaly for a few seconds. And then the mm -hmm. Friar is just like, oh, it's probably okay. And you're like... Not, not to mention the fact that if you stand in the mystic 
forge after making one of the two choices, like that which one could have been forever. Yeah. You become an anomaly again. Yeah. And it's like, what's happened to me? <laughs> like that's and that's not addressed. And that sucks. Like the only thing that is remotely addressed as far as like lay magic and like anomaly things, because those were tied together is in uh, Path of Fire maps in the bounties, when you walk past the bounty boards and like people yeah. are calling out the bounties, they're just like, oh, so-and-so went mad with lay energy consumption or something. And yeah. like, I heard that like first in the demo and I was like, oh, that's so cool. Are they going to bring that back? Like, and, nope. <laughs> nope. Just a voice line. <laughs> yeah. And, uh, but, and then there are those, um, uh, mechanics with some of the, the bounties that there's that lay energy build up and you have to like yeah. clear that off of you. And that's right. I, I just, you see all these hints and it's just like, Anet, please just give us something. Let, just let us use the freaking <laughs> shadow stone to clear that lay energy on the bounties. No, that's it. <laughs> I'll be happy with that. Gosh, I just I just want that finished and I want it continued and at, I that's the one thing I don't like about the current events is that they had two going simultaneously and that was cool because mm -hmm. it was like uh, what white mantle things bandits yeah. and the lay magic. Mm-hmm. And that was cool, and that was fun, because you always had different things. It was just like, oh my god, the world is going to end, because everything is just falling I mean, was, apart. <laughs> the world was alive again. There was stuff happening in old maps that you didn't go back to in forever. Like, I went yeah. back to freaking um, Frostgorge Sound to hunt down that bloodstone-crazed beast. I haven't been to Frostgorge Sound since I beat the story mode of Tranquility of the Waves, or whatever it was called. Honor of the Waves. Honor of the Waves. I don't <laughs> See? <laughs> I, was like, I did the story mode, and I was like, out. I don't <laughs> care about this stupid cold place. Get out of my face. <laughs> yeah, like, it was so good. Because, like, I hadn't really, like, seen much with the, um... Like, the whole thing that they boasted when I first got the game was that they had, like, a, you know, a living world. A living world, yeah. Yeah, and that the world would change as events happened. And that is so awesome. And I love seeing that oh, with, man. like, Don't even Lions get me started. <laughs> and, like, you don't... Don't even e get me started. <laughs> and now it's just, like, I don't... You don't see that all that much anymore. And then the current events kind of started bringing that back. But then things stopped, and now, and then, like, I remember, um, when, when, right before the, um, the Living Story episode with Lake Doric, um, mm -hmm. because there was that, uh, thing where they're like, oh, the dam is gonna be destroyed. I remember yes. all yes. morning, there were squads in LFG all over the place, every instance of Queensdale you could find staring at the the dam wall. Like, not, not well, the wall of the dam. Not, well, I guess also the dam wall, but... Yeah. <laughs> but, um, just staring at it. Like, waiting for the update so that when, when the update hit, we could re-log and come back in and see it destroyed because it's the living world. And if it's going to be destroyed, then Queensdale is going to be flooded because of all of this you know, water and all this stuff is going to happen. And it's going to be so cool. And then we re-logged and literally nothing changed. <laughs> and it was the... the it was the dam in the back. It was the dam in the back of Lake Doric, not the front of Lake Doric. And oh my in God, ain't it? <laughs> yeah. So I've told you this a million times. I might have even said it in this podcast previously, but like, so my definite, definitive, th I'm going to play this game forever moment was um, after wandering around entranced with Kaladin Forest for the past you know, two, three hours, mm -hmm. just soaking in things, burning things with fire. <laughs> um, trying to climb that jumping puzzle because I didn't realize you had to eat the fruit that you got at the bottom to get the hero point. Oh, uh, yeah. <laughs> um, I, I finally make it all the way to Kessix and I, and I load in and I'm like, huh, this is weird. The loading screen's all 
broken and crazy. I wonder what's in here. And then you see the the r- remnants of the Nightmare Tower and just, what the fuck happened here? Mm-hmm. What is this? Yeah. What? Is this and you have to you have to clean it up and there's still toxic stuff going on in the in the like surrounding area yeah. and you're like and and then not even like at that moment I was like this is this is cool this is a nice map I like how there's there's like something that happened here um, mm-hmm. and I was like wait a minute this was a thing that actual players did mm-hmm. this was not something that just happened in the previous history of the game like this is not something that happened in Guild Wars one that we're getting around to now like most of the ruins and stuff in in Cal and the Forest mm-hmm. this is actual player history of Guild Wars 2 that I'm witnessing right here, that I just wandered into. And that feeling right there, that that, like, this isn't just a static map. This is this is a, an actual, things have happened in this world that I can ex- that I can, I, I didn't experience myself but I can see the effects of. Yeah. Is just, is something, was something in, in, incredibly new and mm-hmm. fresh for an MMO. And I was like, okay, I'm playing this MMO forever. Like, I I wish I could have seen Kessex before, because Kessex is actually one of my favorite maps. And mm-hmm. I really have no reason why, it just is. <laughs> yeah. And I wish that, like, I could have seen what Kessex was like before, um, but I joined, like, right after. <laughs> right, right, and yeah. I I was... I was in the game at the time the stuff in Lion's Arch happened, but I I was, like, in the game for, like, a week. <laughs> so yeah. I didn't fully understand what was going on. I didn't actually get to see it. I didn't get to see old Lion's Arch because I was still too low level to actually make it there because I didn't realize mm-hmm. you could use uh, the portals. <laughs> um, right, right. So I was like, I'm going to run through Kessex and Gundaren and all these maps to get to Lion's Arch. No, you're not going to do that on a level 5 character. <laughs> yeah, bad plan. <laughs> bad plan indeed. Yeah. But but I did like, like when I did get to Lion's Arch, it was just destroyed. And it was like so broken. I'm just like, whoa, I obviously missed the event. <laughs> Right, because right. my friend had told me like, "Oh, lions are just so gorgeous. You got to get there before the thing happens." I'm like, "What do you mean before the thing happens? Like, like <laughs> there's things that happen that destroy the world." <laughs> and yeah. so I was like, "Okay." So I was trying to get there, and I didn't get there in time. When I did get there, I was just like, "Oh my god!" <laughs> so, so that was cool, even though I didn't get to see the actual thing, and like. As y- the longer you play, like, because honestly, in the early days of w- when you play, I think basically any game, you're getting used to the game and the world and the lore and, you know, all the other stuff. And if you're role playing, then you're also getting used to your character and, you know, mm-hmm. the, gr- the people that you're with and all this stuff. So you're not necessarily, like, actively engaging in gameplay. At least I wasn't, especially for, like, the first two years I had no interest in really playing the game I was just there for the role play (laughs) right um I mean to say I had no interest in it is wrong I just didn't see the point in like doing dungeons if I bought the game to role play with right so I wasn't actually like interested in really like you know mechanics and proper gameplay um and then like now like fast forward four years I I know my class, I know what I'm doing, I know everything about this game that I, well, I think, that I can possibly know at this point, like, you know, gameplay-wise, because... Apart from maybe raid mechanics. Mm, depends on the raid. <laughs> I know Veil Guardian, like, the back of my hand, because I've done it so much. <laughs> right. Um, but the raids are just... Mm, I have... I have issues going into raids just because I, well, up until recently, I hadn't updated my gear, so I had an outdated build, mm-hmm. and I was just like, I'm not changing it because it's too expensive. So I finally yeah. changed yeah, it. I know, that. I know and, that feeling. Yeah, and so now I'm just like, I have the proper build, but I'm like, I have no idea what I'm doing, and everyone wants experienced players, and it's really hard to find a training raid. Um, and I'm not going to go into a raid with fully experienced players and be like, I know what I'm doing when I don't. So, right. <laughs> so 
so it's difficult to find uh, people who are willing to teach you when you have zero experience. So yeah. That sucks. Um, otherwise, I would, <laughs> but but yeah. So like, I mean, I mean more like open world related thing. Well, yeah, because raids aren't necessarily open world. Um, right, right, right. But yeah, like I I know Tyria as as well as I possibly can at this point, and. Mm-hmm. I when current events started coming out, I was like, "Oh my gosh, this is it! <laughs> Things are going to be changing." Right. And I'm Living story, be, two yeah, point baby. Yeah, and I'm going to be seeing it firsthand. And I was in that fucking squad in Queensdale. Like I was there. I was like, "Oh my god, it's going to be so great!" No, I was so sad. I think I actually cried <laughs> because I was just like, "No, I wanted to see the thing." And there was definitely at least a scream of frustration on my end because I, I was also there. Yeah. I was also waiting for the update to drop, being like, "Okay, let's head over to Queensdale. Mm-hmm. Let's check out the let's check out the dam. Looks pretty sturdy, you know." Mm-hmm. Okay, time to go to bed. Wake up tomorrow morning. Mm-hmm. There's the still the dam. You've got to be fucking kidding me, yeah. ain't it? And that that patch was late too, so everyone was just like waiting like crazy, like. <laughs> Yeah. 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 Oh my gosh. And then oh, it's just like these like they'll add like NPCs or like small things. And that's great. Like don't get me wrong. Like I love that. I love when I'm map completing and I'm just like that wasn't oh, there I haven't before. Oh, I've seen this before. Yeah. Yeah, the package of suspicious crates. Yeah. Banded note. What yeah. What is this nonsense? Yeah, it's just like I it's like I map complete so much. I'm just like running past, and I'm like, wait a minute, run backwards, <laughs> like check this out again. It's like, oh, this is new, and so like whenever I see things like that, I'm like, oh, I gotta check it all out. I gotta, I gotta do this stuff. Like, and then the rifts that show up all over Tyria. Yeah, like, those were so yeah. cool too. But those I'm just really like, cool. I, I, I do. Well, it's I don't know if I can miss it because I never really experienced it like firsthand. Yeah, it's like more live, I wish that but, would happen. Yeah. Yeah, like maps that are interactive with each other, like an actual world, whereas now I think Anet has said that each map is sort of a snapshot in time now and they're not going to yeah. do stuff like that again. And I'm just like yeah. that really sucks cuz that was one of the huge I think selling points of the entire game is that they that they weren't just a static world like things it was a huge cohesive world that you know yeah. things that happened in one part would affect another part, and yeah. But I mean, so like I do think that the the, the, the that I, I do think they would, I wish they would go back to the small thing, the small um, living story updates for like the the current events for season four mm-hmm. because it still does have an effect. And like I mentioned, how I was playing through the story again with my boyfriend. Because mm-hmm. um, he's going through the first through it the first time, mm-hmm. and so we were out in Queensdale, mm-hmm. and you know the um, the crazed bloodstone mask achievement, mm. where you had to pick up the you had to go fight the crazed bloodstone creatures in all the different places. Yeah, you had to pick up the shards in all different places. We were running around Queensdale. My boyfriend was like, "Hey, what's this thing over here?" I was like, "What thing?" Because I'd already completed, it. I'd forgotten it was there. Mm-hmm. Like, bloodstone chunk. Hmm, strange. Why is there a bloodstone chunk in a tree? And I'm like. Oh, <laughs> yeah. There's a bloodstone chunk in that tree. Mm-hmm. Yeah. You sh- you should pick it up. <laughs> yeah. Exactly. Right. Any more questions? So many more, but we have oh, been boy. talking for two and a half hours. Let's do one more. Um. Okay. So, uh, so this it's actually a really broad topic. So we can kind of start it, and then we could sure. like leave off on it like a cliffhanger. Sounds perfect. Um, so it's uh, exploring the concept of the dream of dreams. Um, and one example they give is like how the dream provides Silvari knowledge, but not experiences. Um, I also think that there's like some, I think things that they might be also getting at is like how Silvari wake up just intrinsically knowing how to talk. Um, mm, yeah. Like, uh, like, you know, some Silvari automatically know how to read. Uh, automatically know how to cook because of the dream, like, and that's just knowledge and of like you know specific what do you call it life skills that are just passed through the the tree and dream into the Silvari. 
Um, like, you know, you've never read a book in your life, but you can open this book and you can see these markings on the page and you know what they mean. On the flip side of that, I know that there are some people who RP it with their characters not knowing how to read. You know, some, some skills, like, everyone pretty much uh, picks and chooses what their character knows how to do, like, basic things, like survival things, knows how to do from the dream. I think the only thing I gave Lily, obviously talking, and reading and writing, but yeah, otherwise she was just a blank fl fucking slate. She wanted to learn how to bake, so she started baking, and she sort of picked it up real easily, and she's like, this seems familiar, but I don't, I've never baked before, but this is relatively easy for me. Right. Uh, and so baking became something that she stuck with because it it felt familiar. It felt easy to to do. So she spent more time doing it and got better at it. Uh, and now mm -hmm. she she bakes all the time. Same thing with archery for her. Like she didn't automatically learn the bow. Um, she didn't have any real fighting skills early on. Mm -hmm. But when she started learning archery, it was, again, it was, like, familiar, and it felt natural, so she stuck with it. She practiced daily for, like, hours, and so she got she got better and better at it. It's not that the dream, like, was like, oh, you know how to shoot a bow, here you go. Right, she, right, you can, you can shoot the wings off a fly from nine yeah. yards away. God, she still, she can't do that now, but... <laughs> right, right. <laughs> but, uh... But yeah, like, so it's something that, like, it felt natural, it felt right to her, so she stuck with it. And if it's usually if it's something that doesn't feel that way for her, she's not, she's either not going to stick with it, or, well, that's not true, that's not Lily, she's going to stick with it even more. <laughs> and, but, like, some things were a lot more difficult for her, like, you know, blacksmithing did not feel natural, did not feel normal, right. um, but she she was just cleaning up the forge and she slowly worked into it so it's a skill she slowly picked up over multiple years and now she she's not like you know the best smith ever but she is good enough that she can make you know special orders and she can custom make armor and weapons and she can you know earn a living doing it i mean the way that i usually think about um like the actual memory like kind of images is mm -hmm. that the only stuff that you actually ever come out of the dream really seeing from the dream is stuff that pertains to your wild hunt yeah if you're if you have one i had grit come out of the dream um with images of ore mm -hmm. in his head and that was it it was like i see a place with lots of dead people <laughs> that's the bad place don't go to that place i want to go to that place <laughs> and and oftentimes i feel like uh that the dream and kind of the, the experiences and abilities that the dream gives a Silvari become less and less important as the Silvari ages. I didn't really roleplay Grick the first couple of years of his life. I started probably really playing him around five-ish, six-ish, and now he's eight. Mm -hmm. um, but it was definitely more of the, the way that I've, I've seen it in my head is it's more of like a when you when you pop out of the of, the, of your pod, um, you're kind of drawn to certain things. Kind of like you said, you're just drawn to to a primary thing for 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 Grick. It was fire. Mm -hmm. um, he is the flaming boy forever and always. <laughs> um, and then as you start working on things around the the grove, you kind of find the things that you sort of remember, sort of don't that you're that you're good at. After you, ooh, I just threw something that was dead in my hands. Um, after you throw something that you have in your hands around, um, <laughs> no. Uh, after after you end up leaving the grove, after you end up kind of pushing on your own your own path or following your wild hunt, you you lose kind of that intuition that you got from the dream, um, and it's it's much more of a uh, regular experience. It's you have to get better by training hard and you have to discover things by searching for them closely you can't just wander around the space and be like "Ooh, this looks fun let's pick that up i'm pretty good at this huh that's nice and i think you brought up a good point there that i'm gonna bring back 
if I hope our last point, I don't spur you to spur you to make that's the right word spur you to make another string of comments. But in the end, whatever happens in the dream of a character isn't really about the dream. Mm-hmm. It's all about the character, mm-hmm. and you could you could even kind of think of it as it's it's not even the pale tree giving it to you. It's it's more of just kind of like an internal like a real life dream it's more of a a very strange look at what your character is on the inside on the on the in the parts of the mind that the mind doesn't really like to think about or that doesn't realize it's there that that, that's how things like prophetic dreams supposedly work it's not that you're actually seeing the future in your dreams is that your conscious mind is picking up on things that your conscious mind doesn't see and i think that the only thing i would add to that is that uh it's even said like the pale tree says that she doesn't control the dream. She's just she just holds it. Yeah. So it's like the dream is just showing you things that you need to know in order to go on your path. And you can interpret it one way when you wake up, just like with any regular dream. When you wake up after having a dream, you can think like, "Oh my god, that was a a horrible dream and you know I I was running for my life and I died and oh my god what a horrible nightmare but then you know later in the day or the following day or the next week you could be like that dream now that I'm thinking about it had nothing to do with what I thought it did and it actually might be representative of how I'm feeling about this and like so you can always change your interpretation of a dream and I think that that's sort of like a f- I guess a factor in like nightmare court conversion because I've seen some characters who have thought their dream meant one thing. It even happened with Lily like thinking your dream means one thing and then as you go through nightmare and you go through the conversion and you go through finding out who you are in the court you realize your dream actually meant something completely different. Yeah I think that's a good place to leave it. Me too. Yay.